Well, students, here is a quick review for exam three. This is not everything that will be asked on the exam. This is just uh, highlighting the important questions. Please uh, study the concepts. There will be a lot more multiple choice questions based on the concepts. But when you study these questions, it will surely help you get a better grade. So try to understand each question without memorizing it. A large number of questions on the exam is based on momentum. So that is the most important chapter, momentum. So let's take a look at that. Momentum is the product of mass and velocity. Mass has got to be in kilograms and velocity in meter per second. So you get the unit of momentum as kilogram meter per second, as you can see. And let's work out a problem. Let's assume that there is a ball which has a mass of 500 grams and it's moving at 10 meter per second. What is its momentum? First of all, notice that it's given in grams. So you've got to change the mass into kilograms. How do you change it into kilograms? By dividing by a thousand. Because a thousand grams is one kilogram. So you get the mass in kilograms and then multiply it with the velocity, which is in meter per second, then you would get the answer as five kilogram meter per second. So that's the momentum. But you got to remember that momentum is a vector. Whatever is the direction of velocity, that will be the direction of momentum. So let's say that this ball was initially moving towards the east. If so, the momentum will also be towards the east. So the answer is five kilogram meter per second to the east. What if this ball is hit back? If it is hit back at a certain velocity, you know that the direction it's moving now is towards the west. So taking east as positive, west would become negative. So if it's hit back at 12 meter per second, now the momentum is 0.5 kilogram, because that's a mass, times negative 12. So be careful about the negative 12. Why? Because it's coming straight back. So that would give you negative six kilogram meter per second. Okay, if that's the case, what's the change in momentum? See, whenever you're asked to find the change, you have to go final, take away the initial. So what's the final here? It's negative six. What is the initial? It's five. So when you find the change in momentum, it's going to be negative six, take away five, so that will be negative 11 kilogram meter per second. I hope that's making sense. And you know that the ball can't come back on its own, so it should have been hit by a bat or, you know, something. It should have bounced off a wall or whatever. So let's assume that it was hit straight back in this case. And the time of contact between the ball and the bat is given, which obviously is going to be really small because it's just going to touch and come back. So if the time of contact is given, can we find the force? Yes, we can. That's where the definition of impulse becomes very important. Impulse can be calculated in two ways. Impulse is either the change in momentum or it is the product of force and the time. So, if you're given the time, in this case, all right, uh, because I've written all this before, I can't remember the time of contact that I'd written. Okay, 0 0.3 seconds. Can you find the force? Yes, because force multiplied by time should give the change in momentum. Force multiplied by time 
is equal to change in momentum, which is impulse. So that's what I've done here. Force multiplied by time gives you change in momentum. Delta P is change in momentum. So rearrange that and make force the subject. And you get negative 11 by 0 0.3, which is, you know, 37 Newton. So that's how you work out this problem. And this is very important. I hope you're getting it. Let's move forward. Now to the next one. I'm connecting it to this previous question and I've already told you how to calculate the impulse, but I thought I should show you. Impulses can be calculated in two ways. And what are they? It's either the product of force and time or the change in momentum. So what's the impulse in the previous question? It is the change in momentum. Well, what was the change in momentum? Wasn't it minus 11 kilogram meter per second? Yeah, that is the impulse. Negative 11 kilogram meter per second. That is the impulse. I think that's clear enough. Let's move on to the next one. So static equilibrium is important. Now static equilibrium uh, has two conditions associated with it. So we, in this case, we're talking about, you know, a seesaw or so, a meter stick that's supported or something that is being carried by two people. So whatever it is, two conditions have to be satisfied. Number one, the total forces acting up must be equal to the total force acting down. Or in other words, the net force must be zero. Total force up is equal to total force down. That's condition number one. Condition number two is, when you calculate the torque about any point, the clockwise torque must be equal to the counterclockwise, which means it doesn't rotate because torque is the rotating effect of a force. And whatever is trying to turn it in the clockwise, if it becomes equal to the counterclockwise, then the net torque is zero and it doesn't rotate. So that's the second condition for static equilibrium. So here is a question. Here is a five meter long plank, maybe a wooden plank, that two people are trying to carry. And uh, the center of mass of this plank is not exactly at its center. See, it's not exactly at its center here. It's off the center. So the stronger person is going to support this rod here, this plank I mean here, and the weaker one at the other end. So that's what is happening. So there are two people supporting this plank. And one applies the force, double that of the other, as you can see. So this is F, this force is 2F. So the stronger person, maybe the dad, and maybe the child here, okay. So the question is, how far away is the center of mass from the stronger person? How far away is it? So we're actually finding, trying to find the value of X. So how do we do this? Condition number one, the force acting down is 100 kilogram weight. So it's the weight of 100 kilograms. The, there are two forces acting up, F and 2F. So if you add them, that should be equal to 100 because the total force up is equal to total force down. So F plus 2F is equal to 100. Remember, I'm just keeping it in kilogram, but saying kilogram weight to show that it's not mass, but force. Now, from that, you could calculate F. Simple. You would get F as 100 divided by 3, which is 33.3 .3 kilogram weight. All right. Once you get that, we go to the second condition. But before applying the second condition, you have to Pick the point where you're going to calculate the torque. And in this case, 
I have decided to calculate the torque about the left hand. So now what is torque? Torque is the product of force and the distance. Since this force is acting at that very point, there is no distance from that point. So the torque due to this force F is zero at that point. But if you look at the 100 kilogram, it is trying to turn it clockwise. It's trying to turn it this way, clockwise. But the 2F is trying to rotate it counterclockwise. See that? And so when you calculate the torque, we're going to get zero due to this one, but this is going to be 100 multiplied by this distance. And that distance is 5 minus x. Why? Because this total is 5, this is x, so the remaining should be 5 minus x. So 100 times 5 minus x, because you've got to get the distance of the 100 from the left hand. And that should be equal to the counterclockwise. What is the counterclockwise? It's 2f times 5. 2f times 5. Why 5? Because that's the distance from the left end. And now what remains is math. I wouldn't say just math because you've got to be very careful when you do the algebra. Uh, first of all, distribute this. You get 500 minus 100x. And then you have... 66.6 .6 is 2 times 33.3, you know, that's why I put it as 66.6 .6 and uh, that makes it uh, 333 on the right side. And then when you rearrange, you get X as 1.67 meter, which makes sense because 5 meter, the middle would have been 2.5. This is off to the right, so x is 1.67 meter. This is a very important question, and you've got to really understand how it is done again. There's no use of uh, memorizing a particular technique. Rather, you've got to understand what's been done. The two conditions have been applied to solve this. Okay, let's move on to the third one, rotation. Rotational motion, there are a few questions from rotational motion. And uh, when it comes to rotation, it's impossible to condense it into a review, but here is the important part. There's something called frequency. Frequency is rotations per second. Rotations made in a second. So if something is given in minute, like rotations per minute, you got to divide it by 60. So in this case, let's assume that something is rotating at 60 RPM. And we are asked to calculate its angular speed in radians per second. Angular speed is omega, not a W, omega. And how do you get omega from here? First of all, change the rotations per minute into rotation per second. That would be 60 divided by 60. Yes, I picked a good number. So 60 divided by 60, because there's 60 seconds in a minute, and I would get one RPS, rotations per second. That is the frequency. That's called frequency. Once you get the frequency, you can calculate the angular speed simply using 2 pi times the frequency, which is 2 pi times 1, which is 6.28 radians per second. So that's how you calculate the angular speed. And moving on, if you have a disk rotating at 6 rpm, that's really small, 6 rpm, and you have a tiny object placed somewhere here at the edge of the disk, right there, and there is friction, coefficient of friction is given as 0 0.6. You know that as the um, disk begins to rotate, there is a good chance of this mass slipping off the disk. But whether it would slip off or not depends on two quantities. Number one, it depends on the amount of friction. 
Number two, it depends on how far away it is from the center. Right? If it's closer to the center, it stands a good chance of staying there. But the further it is from the center, as the disc rotates, there is a bigger chance of it being thrown off. So in this question, you are asked to calculate the maximum distance at which it could be without being thrown off. So we're looking for x. And the important thing is to understand that there are two forces here. One is the force of friction that's trying to keep it there. The other is the centripetal force. So the centripetal force is equal to the friction in this case, because unless you have that centripetal force, it's going to go off. And remember, the formula for centripetal force is mass times velocity squared by radius. So that's why I have it here. And friction is mu times n, where n is the normal reaction. And in this case, the normal reaction is mg, because n up is equal to mg down. I know, there's a lot of stuff coming in. Can't help it. Okay, so that's why I put mv squared by r is equal to mu as n. And then we have to bring omega into the picture. So here is a substitution, v is r omega, from which, you know, because it's velocity squared, you have to square this whole thing and then put that equal. The mass gets canceled on both sides. Remember, n is mg. And then uh, when you do the math, you know, it's r squared on top and r here in the denominator. So one of the r's get canceled. So you have that. Omega squared r is equal to mu s g. And, uh, you know, the r is the x. Sorry for that. r is the x in this case. And omega is 2 pi f. I showed you that in the last question, didn't I? So when you do that, you get omega. Once you get omega, put it back into that equation and calculate the distance r. Now the good thing is that although I speak fast, you can pause, you can slow it down or go back over it as many times as you want, but try to understand. So that's how you calculate that. Well, of course, this radius turned out to be a big number and that's because the rotational frequency is small. If I had taken it to be 60, instead of uh, six, well, then the distance would have been shorter. Okay, I hope you're doing good. Let's move to the next one. It's also dealing with rotation. In rotation, there is angular acceleration. It's given in radians per second squared, angular acceleration. So let's say that this disc or something else is rotating at 5.0 radian per second squared. That's the acceleration, alpha. And it has an initial velocity, that's omega naught, of 2.0 radians per second. We are asked to find the total angle that it will be making in a particular time, in three seconds in this case. What is the total angle described? You know that each time it rotates, the angle is 360 degrees or two pi radians. We're gonna get the answer on radians here. So what is the total angle? Now when you go back into kinematics, you should remember that there is a formula like this. You have a similar formula in linear kinematics. This is rotational kinematics. Theta is omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. It's all there on, there on your formula sheet. Just need to know which one to use. And all the other quantities on the right side are given. So omega naught is 2.0, time is three seconds, plus half times alpha, 5.0, time again three, so three squared, and um, two times three is six, plus that becomes 22.5. And then you add both of those quantities, you get 28.5 radians. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. So that's about rotation. Let's move on. Young's modulus. There was one question on Young's modulus. You know, Young's modulus is where you have a, a cable, a metal cable, copper, steel, aluminum, whatever, 
one end of it is fixed rigidly and at the other end you're applying a force, if the force is big enough, the metal is going to extend. When it extends, there are forces inside and uh, there is an important property called Young's modulus that determines how much it stretches. Like if it's rubber, it's going to stretch a lot because the Young's modulus of rubber is small. But if it's steel, it's going to stretch very little. And the formula involves the force applied. It has the area of cross-section. Now remember, usually cross-section is circular, so area is pi r squared. It also involves the length of the cable. So you see all those terms in the formula. That's Young's modulus, the force applied, the area of cross-section, that's the original length of the cable, and delta L is how much it elongates, which is what we're trying to find in this problem. So you'll be given all the other quantities, kind of. Let's assume that the original length of the cable is 10.0 meter. The radius, it's a very thin cable, so it's one millimeter. Oh, that's a red flag, can't have it in millimeters. So I changed it into meter. One divided by 1,000, which is, put it as 0 0.001 or 10, 10 raised to negative 3, same thing. Area, I remember, is pi r squared. So pi times the radius squared. So that is pi times 10 to the negative 3 squared, which is pi times 10 to the negative 6. All right? Okay. I think I'll stop recording. So, I think the picture got cut off now. Let's see. So, let me continue this. You may not see my face for a few minutes here. So, here it's um, Young's modulus is right there. And uh, the force is given. Uh, force is given as 1,000 newtons. So, now all you got to do is just plug it into the formula. Young's modulus is big, it's uh, steel, so it's big, that's right there, force divided by area times the original length by the change in length. And when you do the calculations carefully, you are going to get the change in length. I, you know, I, I'm just taking this 10 to the negative 6 to the top, that becomes 10 to the positive 6, and then so I can add these four zeros with the 6 here, that makes it 10, so 10 to the power 10. And But you do the math any way you like, but do it correctly. Finally, you end up with the extension as 0 0.15 meter. 0 0.15 meter. That's what you get. Oh, uh, you didn't see my face for a few minutes. I'm sure it didn't matter because you could still hear me and see what I'm writing, okay? So let's go to the next one. In the next one, we're going to talk about buoyancy or Archimedes principle, you know, which is where when you put a solid into a liquid, the liquid exerts a force upwards, and that's the buoyant force. Remember that the buoyant force is always equal to the weight of fluid displaced. So when the ship is floating in the ocean, whatever weight of water the ship can displace is going to be the buoyant force. And how do you calculate weight of anything? Weight is always mass times g, mg. And mass is volume times density. So, when you calculate the buoyant force, here's the ready-made formula. You multiply the volume of the liquid displaced, or I can say fluid, because it could also be gases. So, volume of the fluid displaced multiplied by the density of the fluid times the acceleration due to gravity. So, here's the formula. Remember, it's going to be the volume of fluid displaced times the density of fluid times g. So let's assume that there is an object which has a volume of 0 0.01 meter cube. 
and it's uh, floating, uh, not floating, it's in water, it's in water. Assume that it's completely immersed in water, it's just gone down. So that means the volume of the solid in this case is equal to the volume of the fluid. Why? Not always, but in this case, because the whole solid is underwater. So the volume displaced is its own volume. And that's why I did 0 0.01 times the density of water, which is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube, times 9.8 meter per second squared, and you get 98 newtons, all right? So that's the buoyant force on this object. Now, assuming that this object had a weight of, can't remember what I said, okay, 120 newton. Will this float? No way. Why? Because the weight of the object is more than the buoyant force. It cannot float. So whenever an object floats, very important to know that it is displacing its own weight. Or in other words, if any object floats, the weight of the object is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. Let me say that again. If any object floats, the weight of the object is equal to the weight of fluid that it displaces. I hope that's clear. That's all. Let's move on. So I was asking that question, will it float? The answer is no, because its weight is 120 newton. Okay. All right, so I think that's all we had. Um, if I don't think I can get more time. If I can find more time, I'll make another video. Otherwise, remember this again. Remember that on this exam and the final exam, there will be more conceptual questions checking your understanding of the topics that you studied during this semester. Before the final exam, I will surely post at least uh, one video I don't know if I can make one new, but I'll try. Meanwhile, do your best. Hang in there. Attempt every question. Do what you can. Taking a test, and especially in physics, is stressful, but don't let it get to you. You do your best. See you on Saturday. Thank you.